advice you give to parents in terms of how to support their children so that their children can become successful in the future? What advice would you give to the parents? If you can, there's a book called um, Mindsets, The Psychology of Success. Okay. It's written by a Stanford professor, I think, Carol Dweck. Okay. I think every parent should read that book. Okay. Wow. Um, it is profound. Okay. Um, it's a, you know, there's research that goes into sort of the psychology of kids who are successful and those that are not. And what, what causes kids to get into a sort of a mindset to say, I cannot be successful. Mm -hmm. And what causes them to be in a mindset where they believe they can grow mm -hmm. and do. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage every parent to read that book. Okay. Uh, the second thing I would say is that it is very important to talk with, our, with kids. And, you know, one of the things that I do with my children, um, especially with my daughter, is, you know, we discuss lots of things, right? So when you watch a movie with, with your children, you know, just being present with them to watch a movie together, right? There's, there's a bond that's created. But how, how so much more interesting where after the movie you actually talk about what was going on in the story. Okay. You know, what was this story about? Mm -hmm. And what are the lessons here? Um, were there things that they noticed in the plot that I didn't? Mm -hmm. Are there things that I noticed in the plot that they didn't? Um, you know, ask questions. And, you know, that's the first way for kids to kind of engage literature, right? Now, a movie is not text, but a movie is a story, just like literature is. Mm -hmm. And they learn something from that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, taking that approach in just, just about everything that you do with your children I think um, is very, you know, if you're thinking about how do I help my kid be successful in school, this is one way of, of doing so. And then you get this added benefit of building this stronger bond with your children that continues as they grow. Right? Okay. I think I want to ask you as well as every interview that you've actually done, everything right. you've actually been featured and actually read it. And I've realized that you're an avid reader. Unfortunately, a lot of kids these days don't see the value in reading. So right. can you sort of like give them advice about why should you read? Because obviously re reading, they say that, you know, if, you're, if you want to be a leader, you need to be a reader, otherwise you right. can't lead. So can you sort of like encourage them in terms of why is reading so important to you and why do they need to adopt that habit as well? Well, I read for a number of different reasons, right? So there is reading that I do that is really for fun. Okay. and. You know, when you're reading just a story, um, a novel, poetry, you know, it is an artist, an author who is describing something, telling a story. And the image that they might have in their mind as they're telling the story in terms of the scenery and so on, might be quite different than the image that I have in my mind as I'm reading the same story. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's sort of exercising my imagination, and it's, apart from it, it's just fun, mm -hmm. right? And then there is um, reading that has to do with um, learning, right? To put it simply. One of the things that I most value about education is literacy, because once you know how to read. Mm -hmm. You have a tool to access the knowledge of many other people. Yeah. Right. You have a tool to access the laws of your country. True. You have a tool to access writings about the history of where you're from or the history of other parts of the world. 
you have a tool that enables you to sort of get immersed in other cultures. Um, and so it gives you a tool to, to continue to grow for, your life, for the rest of your life. Now, as a leader, I can't always meet every other leaders who've done things before me. There are only so many people I can connect with um, directly. But I can read their work. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's the value I see uh, in reading. Girls, like one of my challenges as a teacher is that I want a lot more girls to take up maths at A level, a lot of girls to do economics at A level, but we struggle to get girls to do these subjects. So, what advice do you give to like my female students who are kind of thinking, oh, maybe we should drop maths and economics in, in, at AS level and not carry on to like A level? What kind of advice would you want to give them in terms of why girls need to stay with the STEM subjects and why they need to persevere in that? There's so many reasons why girls should be aiming to do all the things that boys do, right? Um, the most fundamental one is that we're equally capable, right? So we should be doing things based on our interests. Um, mathematics is sort of the language of science and science is propelling humanity in some pretty amazing ways. If you think about the world today, um, everything from toothpaste to the clothes that we wear, the buildings that we live in, um, the cars that we drive, the phones that we use, it all comes from science. So whether it's you know, chemical engineering that goes into cosmetics or uh, electrical engineering that goes into telecommunications. We're surrounded by it. And all of those products um, that are used by men and women, boys and girls, would be so much better if the perspectives of women were at the table in the design of those products. Sure. For example, right? Uh, so, this is why I think that people should be, all people, boys and girls, should be encouraged to pursue their interests um, and to not be intimidated by anything. I mean, in computer science, there are more uh, men than women in computer science in many countries in the world. But it is the case that often the women in computer science write better code than the men. Um, and there's this image that I saw a couple of years ago, you know, when India launched a mission to Mars, they, they launched a probe to Mars. And there was a picture of, well, there were two pictures. One was the picture of the rocket blasting off. And there was a picture of the control room, the scientists that were running that mission. And the image from the control room was phenomenal. Something like almost half the people in the room were women. Wow. Right. And I thought, wow, this is brilliant. Yeah. And you know, those, those are the women who decided to do math and science and so on. But they were right there, sort of at the forefront of space exploration in their country. And what a tragedy when somebody who's capable of doing that um, self-selects not to do it because of some preconceived notion that this is just a men's field or whatever. And by the way, in that image the women were all wearing saris wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know so if you're a young woman a girl who's thinking about your future and there's something that intrigues you go for it so you left microsoft to right. come to ghana set up right. a right and you were at the very top level as an engineer in microsoft doing so well Right. And I watched an interview where he said that 
your boss said to you, why are you leaving to come to Ghana after Shetty? You said that like, you're competing with a dream. So my question right. is, when you were leaving, were you not like, obviously you had the security of a lovely Microsoft job. Were you not afraid right. to quit? What made you decide to like, you know, up sticks in the US and come to Ghana and start afresh? I was absolutely afraid to quit. You were? <laughs> I was. <laughs> but you did. <laughs> you know, I asked my wife if I could leave Microsoft and let's come to Ghana. And the day I asked her, she immediately said yes. Wow. And then it took me a year and a half after I had her full permission to leave. So, so <laughs> yeah, this, was this, this was not an easy decision, okay? okay? <laughs> so the question is, why, why did I take the risk? Why did I leave? And, you know, my boss at the time had asked me, what do we need to do to keep you? And that's when I said you would be competing with a dream. And the dream simply was Africa transformed. Wow. And that I needed to go and have a, you know, I needed to go and make an attempt to contribute towards that. And, and you know, when I was thinking about why I'd hesitated to leave the company, and I asked myself, why are you hesitating, Patrick? The answer was simply that I was afraid that I would fail. Yeah. It was the only reason. There were no other reasons. And at some point, I realized that if I didn't try at all, then I'd have failed anyway. So I, once I sort of redefined it to say, look, if I don't even try, isn't that a failure? then I felt, okay, I really should go and give it a try, at least. And then if it doesn't work, it won't be because I didn't try, right? It, it will be because I, I gave it a good shot and it didn't work, right? Okay. So that's why, that's why I eventually left. Left, yeah, okay. Right. All right. So my next question is, Ghanaians and diaspora were watching this interview. We're right. thinking of also coming down to Ghana, to Africa, to obviously contribute to transformation on the continent and Africa right. to make the move. What right. kind of advice would you give them in terms of coming to join, to obviously hold hands and obviously build Africa and make it what it is supposed to be? Look, I think that there's only one way to do it. You jump in with both feet. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, I had no illusions that this is going to be a different life than Seattle. It is. Um, I had no illusions that it was going to be difficult. It has been. In some ways, it's been more difficult than I thought it would be. But coming in, I knew it was, it wasn't, this was not an easy mission that I had taken on. So, you have to you have to sort of be committed to say I'm going to work hard. I'm going to deal with the challenges. And if you work as hard as you're working outside of Ghana, if you do that here, you'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> so that's what I would say. There's a quote by Get It, which he said inspired you to start this whole journey. Right. Why was that quote so poignant? Why was it so crucial? What kind of inspiration did you draw from that? So I read, I read Get It's quote after I had actually left Microsoft, right? And I was in business school to sort of prepare for what I was about to set up on. And I stumbled upon these words, whatever you can do a dream, you can begin it. Boldness is genius, power and magic. Begin it now. And it was a time when, even though I had left the company, I would occasionally wake up wondering if I'd made the right decision. And um, so when I stumbled on this quote, I typed it up and I put it on my mirror. So I'd see it every day. You know, and I read it every day. Um, and it was just something that I did to sort of remind myself you know, boldness is genius, power and magic in it. Just, just get started. Just begin it. Um, and eventually, I did. When I met you to speak about it, you really for the interview, you spoke a right. lot about the importance of sports. Right. And why kids need to have sports. So, in terms of like other conversation terms, but why do you think sports are so important in terms of like leadership and in terms of how we run our lives 
the benefits of exercise to right. the pain? Well, exercise and sport are important for many different reasons. Uh, I would say principally among them, you know, a healthy body um, makes for a healthy mind, right? And so students and individuals, I would say, grown-ups who are regu regularly exercising are also going to have sort of maximum or optimal um, sort of cognitive capability. So, so exercising actually helps your academic work, helps your professional work and so on. And it helps your health, the health of your, of, of your body generally. Uh, the second thing about exercise and uh, which is like sport is that it builds discipline it is a way to uh, learn how to work with others in teams. It is a way to sort of experience so sort of the exhilaration of success and of winning. But also, you you learn you learn to lose. When you're when you're doing sport, you don't always win, right? In fact, you you lose more than you win often. And that's also like really important learning for all of us to do. Um, in my own life, uh, you know, when I was in secondary school we did a lot of sport and in high in primary school as well. The college I went to had a requirement that we all had to learn how to swim in order to graduate. If you didn't pass a swim test you, you wouldn't graduate. So I learned how to swim. And I also picked up martial arts there. And the interesting thing about these two things is that, you know, when um, my son was born, six months after he was born, I, we were in Jamaica, and I was on a sailboat, and um, I, fell, I fell off the boat. And so here I was in the Atlantic Ocean. And I remember this guy leaning over the boat, the edge of the boat, and, and shouting, can you swim? I didn't have a life vest. And I said, let me check. And as I was saying the words, let me check, I knew I was fine, because obviously I was, I was well, treading <laughs> water, and I was okay, and I made it back to the boat. But, you know, just learning how to swim in college prevent, you know, saved my life or at least at a minimum saved me from drinking a lot of the Atlantic, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, 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 um, it saved the life of my six-month-old son, right? And so a really important thing, um, the martial arts, I still practice that. It's like, I love to do it. It's um, something that I've, that is, is part of me since college, like to, to today, right? And you know what a gift, right? So that's how that's how I see sport and, and exercise. My next question is: When you're not working, what do you do for fun? <laughs> what do say? What do for fun? Well, we've already talked about those things, and it's not a lot. I mean, it's I read, I exercise, I do the martial arts every weekend. Um, I. Uh, you know, I hang out with my family, um, occasionally hang out with friends, you know, they come to our, our home or we go to theirs, um, you know, that's what I do for fun, yeah. I was telling you about the importance of advice in my own personal life, the fact that right. I learned so much from just getting advice from people. Right. And giving the example of a student who come to see you about relationship issues and giving it, it these three sort of like right. test or models. Right. You said number one was compassion and then compatibility and competence. I right. think that was so profound. I've been thinking right. about it since then. By the way, there's day. a fourth one as oh, well. Oh, is there? Okay. Chemistry. Chemistry. <laughs> okay, chemistry. Chemistry. So please, can you sort of like go through the list and tell me what you told me that day? Because it was so deep. Well, look, I just think that, you know, um, any kind of relationships, and especially if you're thinking, we're talking in this context, marriage, marriage yeah. right? And marriage is like a very long-term relationship. This is someone you're going to be living with you know, raising a family with and so on. And it's, you know, and this is not just all my own ideas, by the way. I mean, it's conversations I've had with friends. Um, 
that it seems that when you're making a decision like that, you know, some people are moved mostly by sort of chemistry, you know, sort of raw physical attraction, and it can overwhelm everything, right? But it seems like you need to think about also, are you compatible? Do you have a shared set of values, you know, you and this person? Um, is the person considerate and compassionate, not only towards you but towards others, right? And, uh, you know, if they're not considerate, um, there might be problems down, down the line, right? And, you know, I think if we talk about competence, right? And competence is like they've got a job or something that they do that they like, that they're competent at. They're not, they're not an addict, they're not addicted to you know, alcohol or drugs or whatever. You know, you know, these are all sort of, sort of good baseline to have. And by the way, this applies to you as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, and so, you know, and I found that just in life looking at also some relationships that, that I've observed, that um, actually all four are important, but you've got to be careful with the chemistry one because sometimes that one overwhelms the other okay, three, yeah. So right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Wow, wow. Well, thanks for adding the chemistry one today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, that, that's really good. So my last question is, yeah. when all is said and done, what right. would you like to know about? What kind of legacy are you trying to build? Look, I will be happy if people say that this is someone who tried, um, did, did the best he could. Um, and to be honest with you, when I started this project, this journey with a chassis, I used to think about legacy more than I do today. So. You know, I wanted, okay, I'd build an institution that would last and um, that would make a difference. Um, and a part of me wanted to be remembered for that institution, right? Um, today, I actually don't care if I'm not remembered. Wow. I really don't. That's all the sweat and toil? It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't bother you? It is not important. Okay. I think the important thing is the mission, right? So, if Africa is transformed, that's good. Yeah. If Ashesi University is a force for good on the continent for a thousand years, that's good enough. People don't need to remember that Patrick Ewa was the founder of Ashesi University. What is important is that Ashesi University is a force for good and that it is part of the coming renaissance of the continent. Wow. So Dr. Patrick Hill, while we've come to the end of the interview, I just want to say thank you so much. For me, right at the beginning of my teaching career, I would listen to your TED talk uh -huh. and it shaped who I've become today. But to actually come here today for the first time, I've, I've actually said I've actually waited a decade for this. Uh -huh. I always knew I wanted to talk to you, but I was like, when will be the right time? And this trip to Ghana, I knew that it was the right time. So for allowing me to come here, I know your time is so precious, so limited, but I yeah. gave me the opportunity. I just want to say thank you so much. And it's very impressive, and God bless you and keep you and make everything that you do here very successful. But from my heart, thank you so much. And on behalf of my students as well, we're very grateful. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank it's a pleasure. You. All right, thank you very much. It's a wrap. Oops. <laughs> <laughs>